most times when we watch some type of professional sporting event, anything that's competitive like chess, UFC and mixed martial arts, boxing, tennis, we're watching the best of the best versus the best of the best. And a lot of times because of this, we take it for granted and we don't realize the skill level that's required to compete at this level. The next game of chess I'm going to show you is Grandmaster Magnus Carlsen, the former world champion and still the best player in the world, versus Grandmaster Ben Feingold, who's a YouTube sensation, a very popular chess teacher, and is statistically better than 99.999% of chess players in the world. People who play chess know how hard it is to become a grandmaster, so we know the skill level required to be as good as him. And to see Magnus Carlsen crush him, spoiler alert, with ease is extra remarkable for us because we know how hard it is. So in this game, I want to show you guys how the best in the world handles an extremely talented chess player with ease. Okay, let's get started. Okay, in this position, Magnus Carlsen plays d4, and we just have a uh, typical queen's pawn opening here. Not much to really talk about. Magnus Carlsen goes for the queen's gambit. Uh, not really much of a gambit because the bishop's on here, but similar type position. And uh, Ben Feingold here takes the knight. Now, why does he take the knight? Uh, usually, uh, bishops don't just take knights. Usually, we preserve the bishops. But in this position, the idea here was if he comes down and checks white, white can just block with the knight and defend. And if he took, this is very comfortable for white. <clears throat> so uh, in this position, Ben Feingold took. And the point is, after Magnus takes back, the check leaves white um, vulnerable in this diagonal, and he cannot really block in a safe way. He needs to move the king aside. Now, this sounds good in theory, but actually Magnus is totally fine here, believe it or not. So Magnus wins this game also by violating most of the general principles of chess, and I'm going to show you this right now. I'll explain further. So now Magnus can castle. That's one. And Magnus's king is in the center of the board, but he's still able to evaluate this specific position and realize that this is absolutely totally fine. So let's go ahead now. So Ben Feingold's like, okay, I got you to you know forfeit your right to castle. Now uh, I'm just going to bring my bishop back, and uh, I'm the man pretty much, right? So Magnus is like, wait a sec. I'm going to pin your knight. I don't like when pieces can move. I'm going to paralyze your knight. So, okay, Ben Feingold plays in the center because he's a very good player. And we have an exchange in the center. Normally, we don't open up the center when our king is in the center. So Magnus Carlsen's king's in the center. He forfeited the right to castle. And also, he's opening up the center. All this doesn't make sense. But he's Magnus Carlsen. So he throws in a check. Okay. Here, Ben Feingold blocks. Okay. So far, so good, right? Magnus, again, taking pawns in the center, right? He takes his pawn, and now he takes the knight. Now, for a couple of reasons, this is counterintuitive. Again, this is the fourth uh, principle, I believe, Magnus Carlsen violated in this game, or at least it seems very uh, unnatural. So in this position, uh, we have the knight here, and the the knight is pinned. So normally we don't take pinned pieces. Also, normally we don't take a knight for a bishop. We'll usually preserve the bishops, especially since we have the bishop pair. The bishop pair is considered an advantage in chess because they work really good in tandem with each other because they take all the squares of the board. The, this one takes the dark squares. This one takes the light squares. They're two long-range pieces, and they work very good together. Also, this pawn is isolated and weak and vulnerable. But Magnus is like, I'm going to forfeit my two bishops and, and, you know, pretty much better your pawn center and, you know, keep your pawns intact. However, this is completely winning for white. Not super winning, but it's definitely winning for white. And here, Magnus just simply just goes queen c2. I'm going to attack your bishop like a barbarian. Nothing fancy here. And how do you defend it? Well... If you move the bishop, 
it looks like the pawn drops, right? So that's not comfortable. So what if like queen d6 here? Well, now we have bishop f4. And if you go anywhere else, you lose the bishop. If you want to maintain the bishop and come here, well, this is not very comfortable, especially after like knight d4 coming in here and Magnus closing in on the position. Okay, so after queen c2, bishop e7 gives up the pawn on c6, and the, now black has to forfeit the right to castle, and Magnus has a much better position here. Okay, now Magnus just follows up at rook c1. Why do you follow up at rook c1? Well, he doesn't want black to play rook c8. If rook c8, you know, it attacks the queen and takes control over the c file, which is very important. So Magnus knows that and, and just takes control of it. Okay, now we have h6, just like punting the bishop around, seeing where the bishop will go. And Magnus just says, I'm going to just give up another bishop. So he's giving up another bishop for knight, which, again, isn't really like a, a novel idea or, 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 or a sacrifice by any means. But normally grandmasters, uh, especially at the highest level, evaluate bishops slightly better than knights and are very reluctant to give them up. But here Magnus gives up both of his bishops. And then after he gives up his bishop, <clears throat> he follows that move up with king e2, allowing this pawn to go. So it looks like he improved black's position. The bishop was here. He brought his bishop to f6. And now the bishop can just take the pawn. So he's sacking the pawn. But the idea was to connect the rooks. This is how important activity and development is in chess. And Magnus understands that better than anyone. Okay, so here we go. Grandmaster Ben Feingold says, thank you for the pawn. I'm going to win the game. I'm the best chess player in the world. I'm sure he wasn't saying all that stuff, at least not out loud. Okay, so Magnus moves out of the way and attacks. I always tell my students, you want to treat chess like a tennis match. You don't want to just hit the ball back and lob it in the air and wait for your opponent to spike it. You want to hit a nice shot back to try to keep them on their toes. So when you defend, you want to mix defense with attack. So Magnus moves out of the way of the attack and hits the bishop. Now, Black is forced to reply to that. Black moves back to f6, which gives Magnus Carlsen another move. Since chess is a turn-based game, this is an excellent idea to do. This is why it's uh, always deployed at the highest level. <clears throat> and now Magnus Carlsen uses that tempo and initiative to bring his rook that was undeveloped into the center of the board and just simply attacking this pawn that cannot be defended. Okay, and now he goes for a queen trade, Black, which makes sense because it looks like White has a strong attack here and the king is vulnerable. So Magnus just takes the pawn and says, cool, let's go for a queen trade. And it looks like, okay, well, at least Black survived this. At least Black's not going to get checkmated, right, with the queens off the board? Well, stick around. Hold on. Watch this. We have king e7. Magnus just throws in a check and calmly just doubles the rooks. Now... It looks really scary at this point. In fact, it looks like, but it looks like maybe Black can just stop this by playing here. And now this would like slow down the fact that Magnus has the double rooks because if he took, the bishop comes back and now the game is pretty much even and Black can draw this possibly. But no, if this were to happen, Magnus has this other move, knight d4, bishop d4, rook 5d6, king f5 and now the bishop is out of position and he gets the rook yes yes that is crazy so uh black sees that and plays rook b8 and now magnus just takes away this square why do you take away this square let's just go back one move because rook here would be checkmate if this square was covered because if now if rook came here Black's fine. Well, not fine, but he's, not, he's surviving. So Magnus is like, okay, I'll just simply take that square away. And now when I check you, it's going to be checkmate. And so Ben Feingold goes in for some checks, tries to, and then he goes back and covers up this. Now if Magnus comes here, he's going to look really silly and lose the game. But Magnus Carlsen doesn't like looking silly for some reason, probably because he's the best. So instead, Magnus Carlsen plays e5 here, and after e5, black had to resign because the only move that saves the bishop is bishop g5, knight d4, checkmate. So there you have it. 
ladies and gentlemen, um, that was an excellent game. I hope you uh, really enjoyed that video. I hope you got a lot from it. I know I learned a lot from this game. It's very entertaining. And again, like I said in the beginning, we always take it for granted that we're always seeing the best of the best versus the best of the best. But if anybody has like a hobby in some type of mixed martial art, whatever it's tennis, chess, basketball, anything, and you play at like someone that's like a decent high level, um, it gives you an appreciation for how the professionals are, how good the professionals must be. But anyway, I'm going to go. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you like the content, and I'll see you guys later.